Hi, it's Editing Maya here, and since what you're about to watch is a pretty old pre-filmed video and I haven't uploaded a video in a while, I want to say a few words at the beginning. I fully support the protests against police brutality and against the murder by police of black people and against the overfunding of police departments, especially in the US. Black Lives Matter, and I will be linking down below in the description, a site that gathers, gathers together all sorts of different ways that you can help, like by signing the petitions or donating. I will link separately a petition for justice for Breonna Taylor that I will hope that you will sign if you haven't done so already. And also if you would like to donate but don't currently have the funds to do so, I will link down below a YouTube video that you can watch that will be donating all the funds from its ads to Black Lives Matter. And at the end of this video I will also have a brief message to any of my Finnish viewers that might be watching. So now we will be moving to the prefilm part of my March Reads and Receipts. Hi, it's Maya here with my March Reads and Receipts, finally. I couldn't film videos in April, so this is a bit late, but now I can finally get to it. And in this video I go through what I read in March and how I did with my challenges, and timestamps will be below. So my TPR count at the start of the month was 70 books, and the first book I finished in March was Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir, but since I finished it on the 1st of March, I already talked about this in my February Reads and Receipts, and also took it off my TBR then, but it is included in the page stats and book stats at the end of this video. After that I read Far Sector Number 1 by N.K. Jemisin and Jamal Campbell. This is an owned digital comic, sort of a science fiction superhero thing. So this is Jemisin's Green Lantern comic and I read the first issue and it was very promising. So it featured this all new Green Lantern character whose name is Sojourner or Cho and she is from Earth but she is currently uh, in space protecting this one specific city. It's like a massive space metropolis and the plot and the setting seem to be a science fiction murder mystery and I am all for murder mysteries. I like the main character and I like the world and all the different alien races were really interesting and I also enjoyed the art which is a big thing for me in comics. I want to enjoy the art as well. So I'm hoping that the series will come out in trades later on so I can read it a bit more cheaper than buying all the single issues. I bought this on Comixology digitally but I gave the first issue three, uh, three stars since the story is just getting started. Then I read Spell on Wheels by Kate Leff, Megan Levens and Marisa Louise. And this is an own digital comic. It's a contemporary fantasy that I've been wanting to read for a while. So when it was on sale on Comixology, I picked it up. It's a story of these three friends who are all witches and live together. And at the beginning, their home is broken into and several magical artifacts are stolen. So the three set out on this sort of road trip to get the artifacts back. And I could not get into this. I think the uh, the main characters, we never learn enough about them and it really kept me at a distance. I felt like I didn't know enough about them and their relationships. And I liked the issue which had the goat man, but otherwise it was a miss for me and I gave it two stars. Then the Femme Fantail readathon started, so it was about reading fancy books written by women and it was hosted by Jean uh, from Bookish Thoughts and Jill at the Book Nook on Twitter. First I read This is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Mohtar and Max Gladstone and I got this from the library and it is a bit of a cheat since it's not, it's not fancy, it's science fiction and also it's written by a man and a woman team so it's not uh, completely written by women. Uh, but this worked for the challenges of reading an LGBT plus book, a standalone and an adult book. So this is a story about two time traveling agents, red and blue, so they're like time agents. One of them is from a very technological future and one of them is from like very nature focused one and each of them is trying to make their own future happen but the agents strike up a correspondence uh, through letters and through this their relationship develops into romance and each of the characters and the letters were written by each of the authors and i wasn't into it and i tend to like lyrical writing with a book like this it's really important to get into the writing to get into the flow and the atmosphere the writing creates and I didn't get to it. I liked uh, Red's letters the most. I think those were written by Max Gladstone. And I've heard people say that the audiobook is great and really takes you with, with it, but I don't do audiobooks. I'm really bad at focusing on them. So I probably wouldn't have even picked this one up. Uh, it wasn't like a big priority for me. If it wasn't uh, nominated for the Booktube SFF Awards, and it also 
uh, was in my library in March, but it's on this shelf that's like a quick circulation shelf, so those books cannot be put on hold and they cannot be renewed. So they are like paperbacks that you can pick up if they happen to be there at the library. So I decided to pick it up. It's a novella, I think. It's not a full-length novel. So that is probably why I finished it because it was for a readathon and because it wasn't that long. It wasn't for me, I gave it two stars. Then for the readathon I read Redemption in Indigo by Karen Lord, which I borrowed from my sister, and this is a, well, a fantasy sort of a retelling, sort of using mythology from Senegal, inspired in part by the Senegalese folktale. So this uh, qualified for the challenges of a retelling, an adult novel, a standalone, a BAME author and a new-to-me author, so five challenges with one book. And this is a story about Palma who leaves her fool of a husband and she attracts the attention of these beings who gift her with something called the chaos stick, which allows her to manipulate the forces of chance. But there's this being called the Indigo Lord who used to have the chaos stick, who isn't happy that Palma has it and wants to get his power back. And the Indigo Lord sets about trying to persuade Palma to return the power to him. So this story starts in a very folk-like tale way, so it goes through these various messy situations with Palma's husband and how she happens to get the attention of the spirits by dealing with these situations that her husband gets into. So Palma's husband is a glutton and overeats in like to very like big folk tale like levels, so warning for that if overeating is something you can't read about. And this thing is used for comic relief. After those parts, Palma gets the chaos stick and get the attention of the Indigo Lord, and I thought that's really when the story started to get going, and when I got really wrapped up in it. So then the story changes, and it's about these two who make a great duo, Palma and the Indigo Lord, and it's about them traveling together, and almost unwillingly learning things from each other. And that was definitely my favorite part of the book, I really enjoyed the Indigo Lord character. And then I also really like this sassy, omniscient third-person narrator that this book has, that's very fairy tale like and that you don't see often in modern books, like these narrator voice characters, who like aren't characters in the book, but they have their very own distinct voice and personality, and are sort of telling the story to you, which really help with this, helps this with this folktale-like atmosphere. I also really like stories where an immortal being who doesn't really get humans has to spend time with them, and slowly start learning some things. I actually think this would pair well with The Gods of Jade and Shadow by Silvia Morano Garcia, because both of those, both of these have this sort of fairy tale like narrator, and they are about a human and an immortal being traveling around together. So it's sort of a great read alike. Um, I did enjoy this one more because I happened to enjoy the central characters more. I really loved the Indigo Lord, and he was a great duo with Palma, who was more human and more practical. So I gave Redemption in Indigo four stars, and we'll definitely read more stuff from Karen Lord. I actually have out from the library Unraveling by Karen Lord. I think I picked this up in March. So if I want to, I can start reading this one. Then the final book that I picked up for the Femme Fan Tale Readathon was The Woman Who Writes Like a Man by Tamara Pierce. This is the third book in the Song of the Lioness series, and I got it from the library, and it is a young adult fantasy. So this would qualify for the challenges of a book in a series, a young adult book, and woman with a weapon. So in the first book of the Song of the Lioness, Alana, who is this young girl, disguises herself as a boy in order to train to become a knight. And in this third book, she is a knight, and I was sort of expecting her to go on some nightly adventures, but instead Alana meets, goes to a desert and meets this desert tribe and spends most of the book there, in one place. I was expecting to go through this book very quickly like the previous ones, but I actually didn't finish this during the readathon. I'm just not the biggest fan of the fantasy desert people trope. And this book is very focused on that. Of course, it depends on how the thing is handled, and I don't think this is like the worst perpetrator from the 80s of how it handles this trope, but I wasn't big on the white prince as bland new spiritual leader for the tribe. I found not only my reading speed, but also the plot to be quite slow going. It's set in this one place, so I didn't find that very interesting. I did enjoy that Alana was learning to use her magic, and I did enjoy how she didn't conform to her boyfriend's expectations, even when she was conflicted about her feelings, she didn't let him decide what she should do. I think the last book in the series promises to be more interesting to me. Again, I have it reserved from the library, I'm next in line in the whole line. Our, our libraries have opened for like 
quick pickups of reservations and um, returning books. So I'm just gonna wait for that fourth book to arrive and this one I gave two stars. Then I read issue 57 of the Dark magazine which is edited by Silvia Moreno Garcia and Sean Wallace and this is an old digital magazine issue, it's a horror magazine. I'm just gonna briefly talk about the four stories that it had. A Merchant by Rob Costello was the story of this young boy who's dead, telling the story of his death to his homophobic father from beyond the grave and I didn't really care for the story or didn't like the writing so I gave it two stars. Next I read Hollow by Michael Wehunt and in this one there's this old woman who lives in an apartment building and is sitting in the window looking across the street at this weird construction that is going on and she is reminded of her life. And I have enjoyed Michael Wehunt before, I really like his writing style, but the stories I've read before from him was more like my kind of thing, it's called the Pine Arc Collection, it's also in a previous uh, The Dark Magazine issue. So that one was more my thing, but this story still managed to be the only one in this magazine issue that I found creepy at all, and I gave it 3.5 stars. The next story is Ngozi Ugebwe Nwa by Dare Segun Falawo, and this one is about a woman who buys a mirror from this old woman on the side of the road, and I like this, but I don't think I understood everything. I gave it 3 stars. And the final story was Live Through This by Nadia Bulkin, and in this the body of a dead girl is looked after by each family in this one community in turn, and it's about collective guilt and rape culture, and I did enjoy the writing style, so I gave it three stars. And I ended up giving the issue as a whole three stars. Next, I finally read an owned physical book of mine, but since this is a Poro book, and I don't count Poro books to my TBR count, it doesn't lower my TBR count. So this is Agatha Christie's Hercule Poro's Christmas, and it's about this estranged family who gets together for Christmas. And there is a murder, of course. I found the ending solution to this to be completely ridiculous, but I did like the rest of the book. It was very interesting. I was on the edge of my seat for the most of it. I found the family and their complicated family issues like super interesting to read about. And I even forgot about Poirot for a while there. I don't think the detective was the main event of this book. He wasn't the biggest draw of the book. I gave this one four stars, even though that ending. And the last book that I read in March was an owned physical book of mine, and that is The Blank Wall by Elizabeth Sangsay Holding, and this is a crime suspense classic from the 40s. So this one is about a housewife called Lucia or Lucia, whose husband is overseas for, um, for the war, and she gets tangled into this murder investigation and tangled with these sort of shady characters all because of her daughter's quite suspect older beau. I like the first half of this or so, where Lucia has to make some quite quick decisions without really knowing the consequences, but the second half was quite lost on me. Um, she spent a lot of time with this one guy that I, I didn't care for at all, and I wasn't a big fan of those scenes of them together, and they were together for most of that uh, second half, and I wanted more problem-solving from the main character. I liked when this book delved into the expectations of a uh, mother and a wife and how she has to be available for everyone in her family and explain everything, explain where she's going and what she's doing because the family isn't used to mom going out and doing her own thing. So when this was about Lucia and her relationship with those in her household, I really enjoyed this, but when she spent time with that one guy outside of the household, I wasn't interested. I gave this one two stars and reading this put my TBR count to 69 books. Now we're moving on to the receipts and I could just say that I didn't really make progress in my challenges and I have to admit that it wasn't a huge priority for me in March or neither was it really in April, but let's quickly go through them. Did I read a book from my 10 books to read in 2020 list? No, I didn't. I didn't read a book from my reread challenge. I didn't complete a TBR char challenge. I actually have two challenges from the TBR char. One of them is to read a book feature in a book haul revisit, and one of them is to read a longest title. And for the longest title, I have the Mysterious Benedict Society, which would actually fulfill both of those challenges. But I think that's cheating, and I can only use it for one. But that one is like on my May to be read, so I hope I can get that read in May and fulfill one of my TBR char challenges. I also did get some ebooks in March, but those are in a separate haul video, which I will link. And finally, for my reading stats, which will include Gideon the Ninth, like I said at the beginning. In March, I read nine books. 
I read 1,891 pages and I read on average 61 pages a day and took on average 11 days to read a book. And my current physical TBR number is 69 books. So that was my March reads and receipts. Now I have to get on it and film my April reads and receipts so that I can finally catch up with not being able to film videos for a while. And May is almost over, so soon I will have to do a May one. But anyway, that's all from me for now, and I'll see you in my next video. Eli hei kaikki suomalaiset katsojat, jos teitä sattuu olemaan. Mä haluaisin sanoa muutaman asian ensiksi, että useisiin näihin paikkoihin Amerikassa voi lahjoittaa myös suomalaisella pankkikortilla. Ja toiseksi varmaan tiedätte, että Suomikin on todella rasistinen maa, että tämä ei todellakaan ole pelkästään Amerikan ongelma. EU teki tutkimuksen nimeltä Being Black in the EU. Sen 12 osauttavan maan joukosta Suomi oli monessa kategoriassa rasistisin afrikkalaistaustaisia ihmisiä kohtaan. 63 prosenttia Suomen vastaista sanoi kokeneensa rasistista häirintää, ja Suomen luku oli korkein myös, kun kysyttiin, onko joutunut kokemaan rasistista väkivalta viimeisen viiden vuoden aikana. Mä laitan videon kuvaustekstiin pari suomalaistakin linkkiä. Ensimmäinen on Ruskeat tytöt ryn kannattajajäseneksi liittyminen, joka on voittoa tavoittelematon yhdistys, joka on heidän sanonsa mukaan ruskeilta ihmisiltä ruskeille ihmisille, ja ruskea voi olla kuka tahansa Suomessa rodullistetuksi tuleva. Eli tämä kannattajajäsenyys, siitä sanotaan tällä sivulla, että kaikki tätä kautta kerätyt varat käytetään pelkästään itsenäisen, ei-kaupallisen journalismin tekemiseen pääasiassa reilujen tekijäpalkkioiden muodossa. Eli nämä rahat auttaa ruskeita kulttuuriammattilaisia journalisteja saamaan omaa näkökulmansa esille Suomessa. Ja toinen paikka, minkä mä linkkaan, on Together with Pride-toimintaan. Eli tämä on Helsinki Pride-yhteisön alla äh, toimiva osio, joka keskittyy seksuaali- ja sukupuolivähemmistöihin kuuluviin äm, turvapaikanhakijoihin ja pakolais- pakolaistaustaisiin ihmisiin. Eli omien sanojensa mukaan he tarjoavat ammatillista tukea, vertaustuellisia ryhmiä sekä vaikuttaa LHBTIQ plus turvapaikanhakijoiden ja pakolaistaustaisen oike- pakolaistaustaisten oikeuksien edistämiseksi. Eli jos teillä on vaan mahdollisuus lahjoittaa, niin nämä on kaksi paikkaa, jotka voisi tsekata. Mä otan myös mielelläni vastaan ehdotuksia muista Suomessa toimista järjestöistä, joita pystyy auttamaan lahjoituksilla. Ja voitte kirjoittaa niitä tonne kommentteihin. Mutta tämä kaikki tällä kertaa ja nähdään seuraavassa videossa.